Your Honor, I entered this case on September 8th of 2009, four days after the government filed their motion to dismiss. In the short amount of time I had to prepare between then and when the motion to dismiss was had, we filed a motion for severance and to be allowed and a motion for a proposed second amended complaint. It is our request that if the court is willing to grant remand that we go back and proceed on those issues separate and apart from the other issues raised by Dr. Tates and her client. Now, the issue that was appeared to be foremost, or one of the main issues that was foremost in Judge Carter's mind was the issue of this being a political question. I would But isn't standing logically prior? Well, I can deal with that first if the court, if Your Honor would like. If you don't have standing, you don't have standing. We don't get to political questions. Well, the standing is involved in several issues with which the judge discussed, Your Honor. One of them, whether the injury is redressable. And the Department of Justice argued that The first question is what's your injury? That's different than anybody else's. That's what I need to know. Well, the injury, Your Honor, is that my client, Mr. Robinson, then Chairman of the American Independent Party, and Mr. Drake, who was the vice presidential candidate, were not given a level playing field so that they could run against a candidate who was eligible. Okay. But they didn't file until the election wasn't completely over. The results were certified, and President Obama was sworn in. What did that have to do with the election? Again, Your Honor, I'll have to defer to Dr. Tates on that. She's the one that filed the complaint. I was brought in for a variety of reasons much later in the process. I came in at the request of Dr. Drake and Mr. Robinson to try to salvage the situation, and we wound up with this appeal after argument before Judge Carter. You may, in fact, have the best standing, but I still don't quite see why you have standing. Well, one of the I mean, you may be better than the rest of them, but I still don't see why you have standing. As Judge Carter pointed out in his ruling, Your Honor, this the ruling and the arguments made by the Department of Justice have grave ramifications for minor parties. I represent the vice presidential candidate and the then chairman of a minor party that ran a candidate. And Judge Carter talked at some length in his ruling, and in the transcripts he talked even further at length, and I argued at some length, about how a ruling such as this, where for whatever reason a minor party cannot challenge simply because they are a minor party, the ability of a major party to put forward a candidate that is not eligible can, in fact, deprive the minor party of all relevancy and all status. I thought Judge Carter was sympathetic to that, but still had the same concern Judge Berzon is raising, is that we're not in the posture of a campaign. That is not the posture of this case. If there is a campaign in which the minor parties feel that they are being unfairly disadvantaged for any number of reasons, have in the past, and there's no reason they couldn't in the future, raise the challenge you're trying to make. Now, you keep saying you were brought in late and that you have to deal with the hand that you're dealt. We have to deal with the hand that exists, and you did not file a claim at the time when the kind of relief that you would be talking about might be plausible, but it doesn't do anything for your candidates now. We don't know whether they would run again in 2012, and if they do, and they have the concern that they express now, there's nothing to prevent them from filing a lawsuit at that time when the circumstances would be amenable to some kind of evidence as to injury, and we wouldn't have to speculate. But that's what I'm having trouble with. I would direct your attention, Your Honor, to the Moody case, which we submitted from North Dakota, in which the State Supreme Court of North Dakota, after the election, after inauguration, after the governor of North Dakota had taken office and was acting as a governor, signing legislation, et cetera, the North Dakota State Supreme Court removed him from office because he did not qualify, did not satisfy, I should say, the residency requirements for the State of North Dakota. Now, that's about the most analogous situation I can come up with 
to this situation. But as you've already said, the result of that would be that Vice President Biden would become president, and you're still where you were before. No, Your Honor, the Constitution would have been upheld. But your clients are – have no more, quote, level playing field than they did before, because this isn't about an election. Your Honor, this is – to me, it's about the Constitution. And if – Well, but what you're really saying is that anybody ought to be able to bring this case, and unfortunately, the law – that's not the law. And what I'm trying to see is how you're different than anybody else. I mean, do you begin from the premise that just somebody walking down the street does not have standing? Well, I disagree with that, Your Honor. I think that the people of the United States have a fundamental right to enforce the Constitution. Well, that may be. Under the cases – the many, many years of precedence in the Supreme Court, do they – can anybody bring the case? Well, but not on this issue, Your Honor. We haven't had cases on this issue. You're talking about the cases of standing to object to tax levies and the like, and that I understand. But we have a situation right now which is unprecedented in law. We have a man who, whether it's true or not, arguably is not a citizen, or at least a natural-born citizen of the United States, and is thus not eligible to serve. And if we say, oh, the election's over, then basically we said that the people of the United States, by a general vote of a plurality or a majority, can amend the Constitution without following the requirements of the two-thirds vote of Congress and the three-quarters of the states to do so. Well, that's not quite true. I think the argument – and this gets into the political question – it's not that the people don't have a way to enforce the Constitution, and I don't recall what the North Dakota Constitution provided, but I understand the argument that's being made is that the Constitution addresses the issue. It has various stages at which the kind of challenge you're making could have been raised or could be raised at the Electoral College at that point, at the – under the 26th – I think 25th or 26th Amendment. There are procedures. The question is, what is the role of the federal courts? Because that's why I asked you, just to be clear, why I asked you at the beginning what your ultimate relief is, because what you want to do is take an action through the federal courts to remove a sitting president, and the Constitution has provisions that address how a sitting president can be removed from office. And that's the difficulty that, as federal judges of limited jurisdiction, we have to abide by. Your Honor, first, if Mr. Obama is not a natural-born citizen, if he's not a citizen, then he never was elected president because he could not qualify to be president. Therefore – That's an issue that would be identified or dealt with by the Congress or arguably perhaps the Attorney General. Well, my point is, Your Honor, he could not be impeached. Unless you have a sitting president, you can't impeach him, number one. Number two, it was the argument of the Department of Justice, which Judge Carter seemed to bite on, that it was up to the Electoral College or the Congress to deal with this issue. The problem with that, as we argued in our brief, Your Honor, in our brief, Your Honor, opening and reply, is that, number one, 26 states in the District of Columbia have laws which mandate criminal or civil penalties for electors that do not vote in accordance with the majority or plurality wishes of the voters in that state or district. So they have no discretion to challenge. And under 3 U.S.C. 15, which the DOJ argued, that provides for challenges raised by Congress to the paperwork of the electors, whether they were properly selected, whether the paperwork was properly submitted by the courts. There's no provision in 3 U.S.C. 15 for any dealing with eligibility. There's no provision for anybody dealing with the Electoral College. So the only recourse to the people is the courts. Otherwise, the second, the Article 2 requirements for the President are unenforceable and therefore meaningless. And that is, that is a result that, that to me shreds the concept of our Republican form of government. We have to have, the people have to have a way to challenge somebody when the powers that be, the majority parties in this case, the Democrats and Republicans, say we don't care about the AIP or the Libertarians or the Natural Law Party or whoever it is. You know, they're unimportant. Only we count. And so we're not going to do anything about it because maybe next time it will be a Republican who's not eligible. John McCain was a subject of lawsuits over his eligibility. Congress held hearings 
on whether John McCain was eligible, was a natural born citizen eligible to run. And they actually made a finding. In fact, their finding actually helps any case we have because their finding implies you have to have two American born citizens as parents before you can be a natural born citizen run. But that's not before the court. But, I mean, this has all been done in the last couple of years, but nobody's willing to take on Mr. Obama. Nobody's willing to ask the hard questions of him. John McCain, it's okay. Not Mr. Obama. How did the McCain hearings come about? The people in the Democratic Party initiated hearings. They were the majority party in the Senate, and they initiated hearings and held hearings. And Mr. I'll strike that. Senator McCain retained counsel, Lawrence Tribe and Ted Olson, if I remember correctly. And they submitted legal briefs, and the matter was voted on. And a finding was made that he was a natural born citizen and eligible to run. The question being over his birth in Panama. Yes, I know. I recall that. The question that I have then is, have you sought to initiate that kind of process? Through Congress? Yes. We don't have the right to do that, Your Honor. Only members of Congress have the right to do that. You don't have a right to petition Congress? Well, we could petition them, but only a member of Congress has the right to request those hearings. So you're saying that congressional members brought the McCain issue on their own? Nobody pressed them to do that? I don't know, Your Honor. The more important thing is the ruling by Congress was, in essence, non-binding. It didn't have the weight of any law. Okay. Your Honor, may I? Your Honor, unless you have more questions, I'd like to reserve my time for rebuttal, if I may. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. Good morning. May it please the Court. Jeffrey Sachs, Assistant United States Attorney for the District of Nevada.